In this episode of Testimony and Musician Story, presented by Sound Seekers, rapper, pastor, entrepreneur Yavez shares his Christian testimony. His story includes growing up with a drug-addicted mother and never knowing his father. Yavez talks about the police and community relations work he is doing in Columbus, Ohio, overcoming systematic oppression, publishing and licensing music, and being debt-free. Additionally, he raps and breaks down In Spring's Ear 2, Prayed For It, Level Up, and You See It in our four-song breakdown. I would like to give a special shout-out to our new Patreon supporter, Lori Campbell. In addition to this shout-out, Lori will receive a His Storyteller t-shirt. If you too would like to be a Patreon supporter, visit TestimonyStories.com for more details. I am Gilega Brown, and this is Sound Seekers Presents Testimony, a Musician Story. Yeah, Columbus, Ohio, born and raised. Okay. And did you grow up in a two-parent household? Uh, yeah, for a little bit of my life, it was just me and my mother. Um, my stepfather was kind of in and out. My biological father wasn't around. Um, my mother dealt with a drug addiction, um, in and out of rehab. My, my stepfather was traveling the world. Um, he was a tour manager for a number of different groups and a photographer. So he, um, he traveled a lot. I mean, all, all over the world. My biological okay. father wasn't around. And so, Around the age of nine or ten, um, my my mother and my stepfather got married, and you know I don't really call him stepfather. That's my that's my dad. You know what I mean? That's the, that's, that's my guy. So yeah, um, grew up in a two parent household, uh, but dealt with a lot of a uh, lot, lot of issues. You know what I mean? From the drug use to you know just being around that lifestyle was a uh, was difficult. And um, you know I know you're going to ask me about how I got into Christ, but that's a big part of my my testimony really was through my family because when my mother was dealing with her drug addiction, she would still send us to uh to church okay. on Sunday. So she would send you guys, she wouldn't go with you. No, nah, she would send me, uh, me and my sister. So on Saturdays I would do a rites of passage program at the mosque. So I learned Islam growing up. So on Saturdays we would go to the mosque and then on Sunday we would go to church. And so uh, that was difficult growing up learning both religions. So why, I'm sorry, why were, was it both religions? Because in the neighborhood I grew up in, um, the nation of Islam was very prevalent mm -hmm. and they really helped out the neighborhood a lot. But then there was also a church um, called ASAC, African American Awareness Crusade, which was more of, they, they were rooted in Christianity but they taught a lot about, you know, blackness and about, you know, loving yourself and about, you know what I'm saying, just, just you know, uh, pride. And so those two together in our neighborhood would always link up and do stuff, even though they were two different religions, they like would partner and do food drives and that kind of stuff. And so mm -hmm. um, they, had a, they had a program, a rites of passage program for young men in the neighborhood where, you know, they took you up under, up under their wing, you know what I'm saying, taught you how to you know, take care of yourself, tie a tie, respect women, all that kind of stuff. So I would do that on Saturday okay. you know, at the church on Sunday. So wow. it was definitely, definitely beneficial um, to be able to connect with them. And I still have contact with a lot of those brothers who kind of uh, grew me up, you know what I'm saying, to, to become who I am now. So my mother would send me to church on Sundays. And one particular Sunday, the um, the pastor, he was uh, preaching about a kid named Jabez. And he was talking about how Jabez's name meant pain. And that was interesting to me because my name, you know, Yavis is my biological name. That's my real name. So people always butcher my name. Probably like they butcher your name as well, right? Yeah, I get so, <laughs> so I can relate to that story. Like, man, he has a unique name, a different name. But I think what stuck out to me the most was at the end of, you know, saying him preaching, he talked about how Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, oh, Lord, bless me indeed and increase my territory. And he said that God granted what he requested. So I was thinking to myself at this, you know, nine, 10 years old, like, man, I wonder if I pray to, to this God, you know, the God that he's talking about, if he'll be able to get my mom off track. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, if he, can, if he can do that, then maybe this is the true and living God, right? This this God that they're talking about at this church is the true and living God, and I'll, I'll follow that God. So I prayed the prayer, like, all right, Lord, if you're real, you know what I mean? 10 years old, get my mom off track, that kind of stuff. 
And like, I, I lied to you not, like a week or so later, I went upstairs and my mom was actually breaking her crack pipe in the um, bathtub. Like, okay. like, you're done. Wow. So for me, at like 10 years old, I'm like, all right, so let me figure out more about this this God of Jabez, right? And um, even though I still had contact with those people at the mosque, like I was a believer from, from there. I was a believer in Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. Um, and so that was how I came to know Christ, like through that experience. And from there, my mother, um, she got saved, received Christ. My father got saved. Um, they now mm. run a drug and alcohol counseling agency. So it's like, <laughs> that is crazy. That. Yeah. And now running an agency and me doing what I'm doing, it's like, God is like amazing how he can turn a whole situation around. I mean, for sure. I mean, that's a prime example of like seeing God work. Yeah. And how powerful to see it at the age of 10 and be yeah. able to recognize that and then dig deeper and say, I want to, I know, I want to know more about this God. That's yeah. crazy. So going to the mosque and uh, church on Sunday, like it's, I think it's so great. Like I love how the nation of Muslim or Islam is so structured and disciplined. I believe there's like just a lot that, we as people, but mainly black people can learn from just being around them. And it would be cool yeah. if like, some of those um, practices, you know, transferred and merged with Christianity. But yeah. did you find that at all a little confusing as a young man or a young boy? Yeah. I, I, I found it confusing, but also rewarding because I had a chance to really make a choice for myself. You know, a lot of people grow up in religion and grow up. Uh, being taught a certain faith. And I think for me, being able to learn a little bit about both faiths and then making a decision based on my experience was more of a beautiful thing than it was a confusing thing. And so even though I may not believe what they believe, um, there are still opportunities to to learn and to grow from from, uh, from that, you know, lesson. And I think that that was the beauty, to be able to experience it for myself um, as opposed to being told what I should believe. Yeah. And so your mom and your stepfather now run this um, drug and alcohol rehab center. Yeah. Do you have a relationship at all with your biological father? So this is this is crazy, man. It's, it's amazing how, how God works. So around the age of 14, I kept having this recurring dream that my father had passed, right? Okay. And so, like I said, me, me and my, me and my, um, me and my stepfather, I keep, you know, just so you can differentiate the two. We're very close, like super close. Like that's, that's my guy. Um, he's managed my career, all that kind of stuff for years. But I kept having this dream that my father had died. And I'm like, Hey mom, I, I think I need to try to get in contact with my biological father somehow, some way. So after like a week or two later, I called and got in contact with my grandmother. And uh, when I called her, I said, hey, this is Yavis. I want to try to find Earl, which is my biological father's name. And she's like, you know, is this, is this serious? Are you, are you playing? I'm like, yeah, this is Yavis. I'm trying to talk to Earl. She said, baby, Earl, Earl passed a few weeks ago. And we've been trying to get in contact with you. So my father, like, I've been having this dream that my father had died. And literally he passed oh around the gosh. same time I was having that dream. So me and him never got a chance to have a relationship and to be close. But... It's amazing because through my relationship with my older sister now and through my family members on that side, like I've learned so much about my father. Like he also was a musician, um, did, <clears throat> did music, excuse me, um, lead singer for, uh, for, for a group and a band and an entrepreneur, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing, he did as well. So though I didn't have a relationship with him, um, I'm very close to my older sisters who I have three older sisters through my biological father. So. And it's just amazing how God set it up. Yeah, for sure. And did you learn about the three older sisters when you called inquiring about your dad? Yeah, yeah. I ended up meeting a whole another side of my family that I had no idea was there. And so, you know, at at the time it was it was difficult because you know you want to have a relationship with your biological father, but I do believe that you know now looking back on it, like God knew what He was doing. And I'm hoping, you know what I'm saying, when, when I, I see him in glory and have a relationship with him then. But um, I'm definitely a guy that doesn't make any mistakes. No, for sure. Yeah. 
that's that's an amazing amazing story uh okay so we'll move a little bit further into the future and <laughs> have you you're <laughs> older now so let's talk about you now you're married and have two kids yeah yeah i got a three-year-old and a should be seven months uh coming up in july oh wow congratulations yes yeah. okay. thank you very much <laughs> yes so and you said she it's the the, little, uh, the girl is seven months yeah is the she, girl is seven months my boy is three years old and is she walking or crawling yet Man, she is trying to scoot and roll up the bed, so <laughs> she's getting ready to start crawling before we know it. She's trying to keep up with her older brother, so it's just it's a very uh, interesting time. Yeah, it is. I have a niece who's two and a half, and my nephew is okay. seven months, so wow. he started crawling. Well, mainly, like it's like this really fast, furious scoot that he does. <laughs> yeah. It's been about a month. <laughs> it's hilarious because. Wow his older sister, she like, when he starts scooting after her, she'll just start running. Like he's like some creature. <laughs> like, ah! I'm like, I'm That's amazing. Yeah. He scoots so fast. That's amazing. It's a fun time to watch right now. Yeah. And you, so how long have you been married? Five years. I just celebrated five years of marriage, June the 12th. So that's why I'm, I, I was out of town for about two weeks, just kind of just hanging out with my wife and my kids. And we, uh, had our friends come down. We have a place down in um in Tampa as well. So we had a chance to just kind of just relax and just mellow out. So That's five amazing. years. Congratulations. Yeah. And how Thank did the two of you meet? Uh, through church. It's, it's funny because my wife and my younger sister, um, they went to summer camp together. Mm-hmm. So we all were, we all were in the same summer camp around eighth grade, but I just never paid attention to, to my whole wife. And then, uh, I ended up going to um, to a church, which I now attend and I'm now pastor at, um, which is her father's church. Okay. And this was about maybe 16 years ago, so to speak, give or take. Um, started started going to church there and um, met her through the through the fellowship. And you know, we've been um, we've been dating like ever ever since. Literally, we started dating uh, when I was about 18 and she was 17. Um, you know, fresh coming out of high school. And, and literally, we've been together ever since. Wow. There we go. Yeah. High school, well, junior high. No. It was high school, yeah. High so, school, sweetheart. Yeah, sweetheart. about, yeah. So high school, we went to prom together, all that kind of stuff, man. Like, um, we dated for 10 years, and then we got married. Cool. And you said you pastor at her father's church now. Yeah, yeah. So he's, um, he's going to be retiring soon, so I'll be stepping in to lead pastor at the church. Wow. That's a big deal. It is. really big deal. It definitely is. It definitely is. And how long have you been pastoring? Um, for about seven years now. So I was, um, I've been a young adult and youth pastor, um, for about five of those years and then started transitioning into this role about a year and a half ago. So it's been a, it's been a process. Okay. And then he plans on retiring in 2020 or 2021? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah. I think it's going to be, <laughs> I think it's going to be this year. You know, I'm not, I'm not in a rush though. Like we have a, um, we have a fairly large church. So it's one of those things where, you know, just, just learning and just being mindful and being patient, still growing. So for me, um, I'm not in a rush at all, but it looks like it's going to be probably maybe the end of this year, early 2021. Okay, cool. So mm-hmm. you do a lot. I follow you on social media and it's kind of, <laughs> it's hard to keep up with everything that you do. So yeah. you rap, you're a pastor and you're also um, promotions and public affairs director for Radio One. When you happen to be, true. when you got the position, you were the youngest person to get the position. Yeah, yeah. I started that at the age of 21. Um and it, it was it was funny because I started off interning there. Um, you know, when I was in college, uh, music was like a very, very big part of my life. So I was producing and writing and traveling a lot. And during my travels, I ended up meeting the vice president of the region at that time in Ohio. And he's like, man, you should consider, you know, radio, you know. And I, and I think at the time, 
I, I began to understand how important publishing was, especially for artists and for a record label. And that's where the money was made at. So I'm like, well, I might as well be on the inside of things to kind of learn about the industry from both sides. And he was like, man, you know, I can, you know, put you in a position to, to intern. And I said, well, if I'm an intern, start me from the bottom. Like, I want to learn everything. And I started as a board op doing um, holidays overnight. And literally within a year, um, they were like, yo, you know, you have a different skill set. You have a great way with people and you're well known in the community. You know, we think you would be great to be our public affairs director. And so at 21, I took over as public affairs director. And um, it was a it was an interesting opportunity because they still allowed me to be able to travel and to be able to, you know, partake in all my entrepreneurial ventures while I was doing the job. And so it, it's been a blessing to them and to me as well um, to be able to do both, you know what I'm saying, to have the things I do on the side. You know, I, me and my wife started a real estate company together a few years back mm-hmm. and we do, a, you know, we do property development and flipping up homes and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, that with the ministry, with the radio stuff, and now with the full the full family, now I'm in I'm in a place where I'm like trying to figure out, you know, what I'm gonna key in on and what's gonna be most important. So, you know, as much as I love to do all these things that you see, I'm I'm getting to a place where I'm focusing on what it is that God really desires for me to be doing. Do you have any indication on what you think he's leaning towards? Um I don't I don't necessarily think it's specifically just like one thing. But I do think that, you know, ministry through pastoring is going to be a very important, you know, part of what I'm going to be doing. I think music will always be, will always be there for me. Mm-hmm. But I also believe that music was just an opportunity to open up doors. Like music has opened up doors for me to be able to, you know, travel the world, to be able to meet all kinds of people, um, to be able to, you know, go to places I never thought I'd be able to go and even to provide for, you know, my family and, and to provide for me to pay for college, pay for other people's college. Like music has been an a awesome blessing. Wait, but I for other people's too. college. Yeah. What, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> You're just um, paying people's tuition like that. <laughs> I mean, I've been blessed. Um, you know, one thing that I've been able to do as a as a businessman is be able to allow my music to be able to be a stream of income that also opens up doors for other opportunities. So um, for for me, especially being an owner of my masters and an owner of my music, um, you know, I have the opportunity to make more than another artist may make. Um, mm. And I learned I learned very early the importance of licensing and the importance of publishing. Um, as well as the importance of, you know, traveling and, you know, just kind of, you know, catering to, I don't want to call it a fan base, but catering to your supporters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I always tell artists all the time, you know, if you got a thousand people who support you on a regular basis, if you get a thousand people to, you know, support you with $5 a month, that's $5,000 a month times 12 months, that's $50,000 a year. Like you got to think that way. See, most times artists are thinking about, I want to sell a million records, so I want to have a million this, and I want to have 100,000 people following me, but it's not really that important if you can't monetize it. So I think for me, I've learned God has given me the ability to be able to reach people, and it's like focus on what I've given you as opposed to chasing everybody else. So yeah. that's just one thing that I've been able to learn and be able to you know utilize, and so music has allowed me to do just that. And you are, you did pay off your student loans. Yes, I did. Yes, I did pay off my student loans. And made a song about Uh, Sally Mae being a hood rat. Yes, yes. It's it's crazy because I, um, you know, I was talking to wife the other day and I'm like, you know, that was a lot of money that we paid into student loans. And I just always try to follow, you know, scripture as closely as I can. And as much as I didn't want to pay off my school loans, like every time I would, you know, look at the scriptures about debt and about, oh, and no man, and all that kind of stuff, I'm like convicted, right? So I said, Lord, if you um, provide a way for me to do it, like we're going we're gonna to make it happen. And so, you know, our thing was that we want to be able to practice what we preach. We want to be good stewards. We want to be good examples. And so we're like, all right, we got an aggressive goal. You know, it was like $60,000. We're like, we're going to make it happen. And we were able to pay fifty thousand dollars of debt off in about three months. So Sweet. wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, so God is God is faithful. So you know, definitely. <laughs> Y'all listen to listen to this story. God is faithful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's amazing. I can't wait to get to that day. <laughs> you will. I'm believing it. I'm believing it for you. I'm definitely proclaiming it. And anybody who that's the biggest thing, man. Like I'm, I'm really big on sharing this information, and it wasn't like some kind of pyramid scheme or anything like that that we did. No, nah, we just sat down, budgeted. Said, this is our plan. This is what we're going to do. We utilized, you know, the opportunities that came our way and we were prayerful about it. And we told God we want to be intentional in our giving. We still, we still were, we still were givers, you know, we still were sowing and he opened up doors to make it happen. So, you know, anybody that wants advice on that, you know, I'm, I'm free to share. Awesome. And you didn't do Dave Ramsey, his program at all? No, we didn't. But you know what? I, I listened to a lot of Dave Ramsey myself. Like, okay. and I got the book and everything, but I didn't necessarily do that program. Okay. But there were principles that he definitely provided that, you know, helped steer me and get me on board. And then when my wife got on board, it was like, all right. So as soon as she got on board, we were good to go. It was, it was no stopping us. Sweet. And um, going back to the professional side. So uh, your website says that you've shared the platform or shared platforms with President Bill Clinton and Jamie Foxx. Yeah. Let's talk yeah, about the Bill um, Clinton. That's a, man, like music, like music is such a door opener. So when I was in college, um, well, this is actually pre-college. So when I was probably, it's around the year of 2000, um, there was a huge uh, commemoration of the Voters' Rights March in Selma, Alabama. So if you know anything you know about history, there was this huge March 1965 called Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, where King and a lot of the civil rights leaders were marching for the right to vote. They had marched, I think, over like 50-something miles to get to Montgomery uh, to be able to have the right to vote. But that Sunday, what happened was they were met by the sheriffs and the dogs, and it was called Bloody Sunday because they were beat, you know, to try to march, they were beat bloody. Um, so I went to Selma, Alabama in the year 2000. Um, as a writer, I had wrote a song called Bloody Sunday, uh, and, I, and I did a tour down there in all the schools. And okay. so um, the Voters Coalition and Jesse Jackson, um, they invited me to a big event that C-SPAN and CNN were putting on uh, in Selma, Alabama at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And so I performed the song that I wrote that I was touring going down there. Uh, and I was probably maybe 14 years old at the time. Oh my gosh. So um, President, like I said, former President Bill Clinton was there. I mean, there was all kind of people um, who were there and I had a chance to be able to perform and to be able to speak in front of, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people down in Selma, Alabama. And so, you know, for, for me, again, music was an opportunity to open the door. Uh, same thing with me meeting Jamie Foxx. So in college, I started a publishing company going into college and um, it was around the time that Hurricane Katrina had happened and uh, Jamie Foxx was raising money um, for Hurricane Katrina victims. Um, a friend of mine who knew I wrote music and produced music was like, hey, you should come to LA to help out with this event. Um, you know, we, we could use some people, some, some marketing people to kind of help us out and some writers to help put things together. So we ended up linking up with... Um, C.J. Saunders, who at the time had just played in the movie uh, Ray, who was a little boy that played in the Ray Charles film, um, and Jamie Foxx, of course, who played Ray in the film. So it was me, him, C.J. Uh, we put together an event at the Nickelodeon complex with a lot of the um, cast of Nickelodeon's, you know, shows and cartoons to help raise money for Hurricane Katrina. So literally through me writing and through meeting people and networking, they flew me to L.A. and I, I did that. And that was probably like, like I said, my freshman year of college so you know just for music those doors yeah. have opened up big things man yeah. <laughs> big things all right and so when it comes to your personal life how do you say that god's presence looks in your personal life uh shoot as you probably can tell my life is very busy very fast moving it's a lot going on so god's presence looks like peace and calm in the midst of all that. You know, people always ask me, how are you able to do all this stuff? And it's nothing but the presence of God, you know, waking up early in the morning and talking to him and walking with him consistently. Like there's a peace there. There's a calm there. There's a presence there that allows me not to get shook 
and to not to get wrapped up into everything that's going on, really to be able to just kind of, you know, navigate through it all. Um, that's, that's how I would define his presence for me in my life. That's awesome. I mean, you definitely need that piece because you have a lot yes. going on. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your testimony. Yes. And let's move forward with music. Yeah. How did you get started into music? Man, it was, music was like therapy for me. Like, like I said, growing up, my mother dealt with a drug addiction. Not having my father around, you know, I had a, I needed an outlet. And so people were always in the neighborhood, beatboxing, and, you know, rapping and that kind of stuff. And I kind of just took to it. Like I had the ability to be able to just put together words and put together rhymes like very easily um, without writing a lot of stuff. So for me, that's how it started. So at the age of eight or nine, I started traveling with a group called Roar. Uh, when I was about 12 years old, we signed a deal with Rescue Records at the time. Tunnel Rats was on there. Uh, Tunnel Rats, Unity Clan, a group, uh, a rock group named POD that came out of there as well. So we were like, um, we were traveling a lot, man, doing music, doing stuff with the Gospel Gangsters. I mean, I've, I've been in it for wow. a very, very long time. So for me, that's how it started. It started just as a hobby. Then I ended up joining a group of older guys in Roar, traveled with them all across the country. And after the group broke up, I, I kept going. I kept doing music, I kept doing, I kept, you know, um, in contact with, you know, solo from Gospel Gangster, Chili Baby, you know, we kept in contact. I was always still doing music on my own as, a, as an artist and then started my own label and started putting out other artists. So that's really how it happened, man, as, as a hobby. And as I began to learn, you know, the industry and begin to allow God to, you know, really uh, define my, my giftedness and what, I, what I'm going to do in ministry, it kind of just went from there. Okay. Wow. And so um, in the greatest story never told on your In Springs Ear 2, you, you talk about Slingshot and just like the early days. Yeah. Um, so when you said that, when you left the, the other group and started moving forward and you started your own media company, are you referring to Slingshot? Yeah, so Slingshot Media Group, the reason we called it um, a media group is because that's what we did. Um, so like people like Trevis, like he wasn't just doing music, like he was doing videos for other companies and putting together concepts for other companies. Like we, what I did was everybody who came in, I made sure that they understood the business side and that they utilize their giftedness, not only to, you know, and go forth and do ministry, but also to make ways for them to have income, even mm -hmm. when all this was over. Mm -hmm. So it was important to me to, to set up, you know, other people uh, to be able to have sustaining, you know, uh, streams of income, even when all the music is over. And I think that's some things that we don't teach, you know what I'm saying, in no. this industry, like, like we just think about, you know, putting out music and that's it, but think about longevity. So every artist that ever was on Slingshot, they have ownership of their masters so that they can be able to go out 10 years from now and put out another project they want to without having any issue. So it was important for me not to just have a record label, but to have an actual media company that worked in branding. And we worked with all kinds of people from like nationwide insurance to uh, shoe companies to you know oh, churches wow. to all kind of stuff. So it's been it's been amazing to be able to see where we where it started off at and what everybody's doing now. <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm super impressed that you just you figured all this out at such an early age, and just yeah. like I need to get on to the business aspect and really focus on that. Um, I mean, all kinds of gems <laughs> you you were dropping, and <laughs> a lot for people to yeah. learn from you. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, and then I think it's just cool looking at Ohio from an outsider. Or I guess, I don't know if everyone's in Columbus, but it seems like <laughs> you guys have a lot of Christian artists out there. You know, yeah, they say it's something, something in the water here, man. <laughs> like, so, you know, from the, from the overarching look, like I'll, I'll take it back, like historically. So you had, so you got K-drama, you got, d they're out of the uh, Cincinnati area. You got a group down there called Jesus to Bus, who did some great work out of 
Peyton, Ohio. Then if you go up north, you got uh, Swoop, who's out of Akron. You got uh, Bumps, who's in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. You have uh, Cephas, who's also in Cleveland. Um, then you have Columbus. All right, so Columbus has Kristen Gray. You got Cambino. You have Armand Wake Up. You got Taylor Gray. All right. Uh, and then you have also, you got Priest. Uh, you got TJ Godfrey, who's who's from here. Uh, man, you got Jay Flu, Trevis, myself. I mean, so Ohio has like a lot of artists, and I'm probably forgetting some too. Yeah. But it's a lot of us here. Um, and, and, and I mean, I don't know, it's just something about Ohio. <laughs> so, with all those artists, are there a lot of like venues for the artists to be at? Like, is it, can you just pretty yeah, much like. Yeah, so, Man, it used to be the glory days, you know. I mean, <laughs> early two thousands, there was a spot called the Underground, uh, and that's in Cincinnati. Um, then you had a number of spots here in Columbus and Cleveland um, that that were just like hubs for for Christian hip hop, you know. What I mean, especially with all those all these artists in the region. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I don't I don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be, and I think I think partially because you know, like like back then, it was it was very organic, you know what I'm saying? It was very organic and it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as commercial as it is now, I would say. Okay. I think, I think now there's, there's been a very, like, instead of the line being drawn in the sand, it's kind of been blurred. So that it's like, well, we just, we just want to be artists. We don't want to be necessarily Christian hip hop artists. Instead of be artists who are Christian. Which is a whole nother topic that people can, you know, say and discuss and go on. But I, but I think then there was a very close knit community and an actual support base that supported that community very heavy as well. And so, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get back to that feeling ever again, that golden era of of Christian hip hop here in here in Ohio. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm thankful and I'm and I'm and I'm believing that um, the next generation will will take that thing and run with it, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds awesome. I wish <laughs> I could have experienced something like that. <laughs> I mean, you would think though, because Christian hip hop is a little bit more commercial and mainstream now that there would be more opportunity yeah. as far as events goes, but no. Well, I think it just all depends on, you know, what your, what your goal is. So, I mean, just to be completely transparent. So, when you look at Christian hip hop, there aren't a lot of um, when you go, when you go to the shows, so to speak, you don't often see a lot of African Americans. You yeah. see a lot of Caucasian kids, white kids, church youth groups. So, so for me, and 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 for me, it was different for Slingshot. So Slingshot shows a lot of African American kids and a lot of inner city kids there mixed in with you know I'm saying the Caucasian kids. Which is, which is not an issue at all, but I, but what I'm trying to get to is the fact that when you think about the, the artists, a lot of these artists who, are, you know, say they come from inner city and they come from the hood and stuff and that, you would, your goal would be really to go back and get the people who you grew up with, who mm-hmm. look like you and who are dealing with the same things you're dealing with, but all of the shows you go to, there's nobody there that looks like you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think it's like trying to figure out, like, how do you go back and get, get your people? How do you yeah. get those people that you, you know what I'm saying, really care about? Not that we don't care about the other, you know, races, but it's like, dude, like, I want to see black people in the crowd that look like me. And I think that's what was different about the movement that Slingshot had. Um, and this is not a knock to anybody else's movement. Mm-hmm. I'm just speaking to your point in terms of when you think about the venues. Yes, there are a lot of opportunities and venues there, but I think if your goal is to go back and save the inner city and save the hood, then I don't think it's a lot of that happening. Got it. No, it's totally understandable. And I've just heard over the years some some of the frustration that some artists have had with that, being yeah. able to reach the audience that they want. Okay. Yeah. So um, you talked about how the whole world changed. We've been trying to yeah. – connect and do this interview for a while and the whole world change. How <laughs> yeah. has it affected you? I know, I mean, we started with COVID and now we have, you know, the protests and these whole you know, Black Lives Matter being popular yeah. now. How yeah. has that affected your day to day? 
So I've always been very involved in just my city and kind of the policies and what's been happening and what's going on in my, you know, in my backyard. Um, and this is no different. You know, we, we, we've been seeing it in Columbus with police and community relations have not been the greatest. And, you know, the mayor has reached out to me and we've had conversations and we've had panels. And, you know, recently they've asked me to join an advisory board that will kind of be a um, sounding board for the chief of police and then also a sounding board to the community like a liaison. So I, I recently took that position as um, an advisor to the chief of police here in Columbus, as well as, you know, the the community. And so that's kind of what what my mindset has been, to be able to work behind scenes uh, on policy and procedures and a lot of the systematic, you know what I'm saying, things that have been put in that need to be taken out. So I've been able to to kind of connect with, you know, um, lawmakers and lawyers and community organizers and those who are really entrenched in the community and have great dialogue and conversation about, okay, this is what we should be doing to help us move forward. So that's my um, contribution to what's happening specifically in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm hoping and believing that we'll see some major change happening, you know, sooner than later. So um, for me, I've been talking to young brothers who I kind of work with, who I kind of mentor and trying to help them get involved in the process, not just protesting, but understanding why you're actually out there protesting, you know, being angry, but also saying, okay, I need to be strategic about how to get what I want at the end of the day. And it's not going to be gotten by looting and destroying black owned business. You know what I mean? It's going to be got by us sitting down, having negotiations, having conversations, changing policy, um, starting to, you know, apply for jobs within the police force, within the fire force, within, you know what I'm saying, the judicial system. Like, it's just a lot of stuff that can, can be compiled on, but we got to start somewhere. So for me, my goal is to help my brothers and sisters be able to start, you know what I'm saying, so that they can be doing what they're doing on their end, and I'm doing what I'm doing on my end to be able to affect change. No, I mean, that's amazing because, well, one, not everyone has the opportunity to have the ear of the chief of police and a lot of, you know, the people who can affect change. So that's awesome. Definitely will keep you in my prayers to anyone listening, like pray for Yavez. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lot of responsibility, um, but it's a, an amazing position to be in as well. It's a blessing, for sure. That's cool. And looking back at the music, how does God's presence in your life look musically? Man, I, I think now I'm to a point where I only want to put out music when I feel like I have something to say. Like, I don't want to just put out music, just to put it out. So, you know, for me, it's not putting out music because I want to tour or because I'm trying to get my streams up. It's because I specifically have something to say to the people. You know, and I and, and that's what God's presence in my music is to me, like him giving me something to say, him giving me a message for those who listen and those who have an ear to hear. That's how God's presence sounds in my music is literally um, him, you know, writing on my heart. All right, say this. That's, that's God's presence in my music. Right on. All right, well, let's get to the music. So we have we have a section called the four song breakdown okay. and it's where the artist raps or recites a verse and then discusses the song. Okay. And so for you, I would like for you to do in spring's ear two, okay. prayed for it, level up and see it. So would you mind starting with in spring's ear two? All right. So, um, let me see. This thing here too. All right. Um, I'm trying to think of how inspiring here too. Even sorry. All right. So you want me to wrap the verse? Yes, please. All right. So, man, it feels good to be a free man. Oh, sorry. I'll start over. <laughs> so I just dropped everything. All right. So, man, it feels good to be a free man. Took the game for hostage, negotiated my demands. 
treadmill through hell, like exercising my demons while looking to the heavens with stones thrown like Stephen. But the stones turned to roses and landed at my feet. The definition of a rose that came from the concrete. I don't mean that you hold me just because your palms meet. That wave is unsure, but I'm sure as Palm Beach. A reminder that you never take the compliments as truth, because a lot of that is people really wishing they was you. But if they only knew about your struggle in your past, never mind the haters will still be mad. See, that is trash. I'll gladly bag you in glad. Neither crip or pie rule, but I'm blood covered, no flag. See, I was 16 with a beam under the dash. My gold D's clean, a fiend pumping my gas. See, I'm as dumb as there. I'm in autumn too. Got heat for the winter. And when I'm through, well, you know I'm never through. Listen, I said I was 16 with a beam under the dash. Gold D's clean, the fiend pumping my gas. See, I'm the epitome, literally, of the last becoming first, reverse when they was ditching me. Now like pop with the top down, they pitching me vividly. Face on my money, blew it and Tiffany. Out in Italy, more specifically, coast of Sicily. Ain't no mystery. I need everything that they meant for me. This is God engineering, so don't you mention me. I've been praying and waiting, can't let them get to me. You ain't never heard me say nothing about what I'm fitting to be. A half million my net worth. I need like two or three. Use tools. I drop gems like loose jewelry. Make every step with discernment, so ain't no fooling me. A lot of guys gassed off lies, but that ain't fueling me. I walk with God inside, so I stay true to me. Truthfully, all the swag rap is overkill. When my people are underpaid and overbilled. When it feels like we in the days of Emmett Till, systematic oppression, but yeah, I'm winning still. So free my brothers behind tall walls. You claim you trail, we at your grill, Paul Wall. I tap dance on tight ropes, no falling off. When you work for the king, there ain't no calling off. Praise your shoe with a true king, the all in all. This here is in spring's ear for all of y'all. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's a little bit more than a verse, but I ain't mad at you. Appreciate that. I gave you the whole thing. You gave me the whole thing. <laughs> I'm not mad at all. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I was feeling that. Um, I mean, there's so much in that. Um, <laughs> what do you have to say about In Spring's Ear too? So it's, it's funny because um, I feel like that verse encompasses everything that I was bottled up inside from you know, just me jumping back into music, you know, man, it feels good to be a free man. Like I'm, I'm free with the music. Like I don't have anybody telling me what I need to put out, when it needs to come out, you know, how it has to come out. Like I, I thank God for that. Like I can just be free to give it how I want to give it. Um, but also dealing with things like systematic oppression. Like I think as, as a believer and as a black man, as a believer, I have the reality that there are issues in this world that we have to deal with as black and brown people but i also have another reality that says that even in the midst of that god can still allow me to be blessed in this situation like god can still allow me to thrive and be great in this situation and so as a believer who is black i have hope in a jesus who provides justice and who provides righteousness you know what i mean so systematic oppression but yeah i'm winning still like that's that it's all good, but I'm still winning. So Great. that verse just a cut encompasses, you know, all of that. You know what I mean? All of that is is in that verse to kind of give you an idea of, of where my mind is at now. And let's talk about the whole the sixteen being sixteen with a beam underneath the dash, like <laughs> like what's so, up with that? I mean, yeah, I mean, like when I was growing up, like I've I've had to to hustle, like I've had to you know do whatever to survive, not that I'm proud of it, but there were just certain times in my life where I was really just not there mentally, you know what I mean? Where I was in a place where due to my environment, I allowed my environment to dictate um, some of the actions that I, that I did. And so that's why I say I was, you know, 16 with a beam under the dash, my gold D's clean, a fiend pumping my gas, like, that, that that was true. But then I went to say that I'm the epitome, literally, of the last becoming first. I reversed, you know what I mean? Like they were ditching me. So now those who are in the front, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm reversed. So, you know, I've had my, my trials and my triumphs. 
I've had things that I've gone through uh, that I've, you know, shared with, you know, my family that I've come out of, which has been an amazing blessing. Like I come from a family of hustlers, you know, all my cousins hustled, you know, I got cousins right now doing 60 years in prison because of that. So yeah. I just know where, where God brought me from and what he, and what he kept me from. And so just speaking my truth about how he literally flipped my whole life around. Because at this point, I mean, you gave your life to Christ at the age of 10, which yep. I mean, is fairly young, but still you are still living in the same environment and growing yeah. up in that environment. So yeah. you still, it, it sounds like it wasn't like you gave your life to Christ and it was just all like, uh, it was, what, what's, what's so, what's so amazing is like, you know, when you got a call in your life, no matter how much you try to run from that call, like it's, it's chasing you down. Right. So God's will is going to be done in your life, whether you go the, the easy route or he has to reroute you. Right. So like, when you put in an address into a GPS and you make a wrong turn, what does it say? It says rerouting. It always has the goal of getting you back to the destination. And so I believe that God's destination for me was for me to always be a follower of him and to, you know, lead others to Christ. But sometimes I tried to go my own way and he had to reroute me. And, you know, through me being, you know, whether it be me almost being murdered, which has happened, um, you know, when me being set up to be murdered, which has happened, like he's like, always on the way just, like, to bring me back. Skip, you can't just skip past that. Like, what? So, <laughs> almost, all right. You know, if you listen to, um, but we just if you listen, to, if you listen to, in, to In the Winter's Ear, okay. there's a song called, called Blood Covered Snow. Okay. There's, there's a video on YouTube called Blood Covered Snow. So, okay. if you might check out Blood Covered Snow from In Winter's Ear, it kind of shares that testimony of, of what happened um, and how I believe the Lord used that situation to really bring me back to where I needed to be um, to, to the point where literally I was set up to be murdered and um, assaulted at point blank range with, with the gun. So, um, I mean, the shot went off and everything, quit my dread. Like, I mean, literally that close. So, um, yeah, so check out Blood Covered Snow when you, when you get a chance in, in Winter's Ear. Okay. We'll do that, <laughs> and we'll move on to the next song, Prayed For It. Okay. Uh, Pray For It is, is one of my more favorite songs because, um, all right, so Pray For It is, is interesting because I did like four different versions of that song. And um, the version that you guys hear is the one that I end up doing with um, Paris. Paris is on that joint. Paris Career is on that, is on that joint. So um, now I, I will probably release the other versions of it because I like all the versions that we did. I just decided to, to to focus on the one I did with um, Paris because that's my guy right now. So <laughs> uh, let me find let me let me let me think about that. Um, that yeah, first. That's, I didn't think about that. Um, while you do that, can we talk about Paris for a minute? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, somebody I just saw a tweet not too long ago about him being like an underrated rapper, and I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been watching him for a while, but how did you guys connect and, and why is he your guy? Um, so what was, what was crazy um, is that me and, me and him end up meeting through Ty, Ty Brazil. And um, I had brought Ty here to Columbus to do a show, um, to, do, to do a concert while he was on tour. And me and me, me and Paris just became cool based off that. Like he was just, he was just good people. You know what I'm saying? Like when he got on stage, I liked his energy. And, and whenever I meet, you know, a lot of the younger guys, um, a lot of them may know of Slingshot or know about the movement. Like it, it was, it was Ty, Paris, uh, What Up RG. They were all together in Columbus. I bought them all to Columbus. And so I had a chance to hang with them and just kind of chop it up with them. And they were just all like, they all became like, like little brothers to me. So me and him kicked it off really well because I felt like we had we, we had the same goal in mind, which was to reach people 
from the places that we came from. You know what I'm saying? And I had always just kind of re- trying to remind him, like, bro, like, no matter what, just remember what, what God has for you. Remember, you know, what you're supposed to be doing and who you are. So, I mean, that's that's really how we became cool and, um, you know, just kind of hit it off when we first met. You know what I mean? Perfect. Okay. And you ready for prayed for it? I am I am I'm ready for pray for it. Let me uh make sure I got the right verse. Let me see. Uh, woke up, check, still blessed. Even if my check's a little less. I ain't gonna trip, gonna stress. Hot yoga, he gonna make it stretch. Motorola, I'll be in the tech. Street pastor, I'll be in the jack. On the field, New York Jets. Produce, fruit, best, fresh. Who God like my God? I ain't seen none so far. Stevie Wonder with the Ray Charles. We gonna ride so far. Motorola, I be in the tax street, Pastor, I be in the black. My flesh deserves death, the cross interjects, yeah. So that's like a really short verse, but since I gave you yes. a long one last one. Yes, <laughs> I'll, we'll take it. We're, we're happy for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, well, you pretty much talked about, well, you talked about all the different versions of Prayed For It, but what about yeah. the, the actual concept of it? So the actual concept of pray for it just deals with the fact that all right. So um, for for me, it's it's very important that the business moves that I make that I first get direction from God on it. So any decision I make, whether it's buying property or buying land or you know anything to do with publishing and anything, I feel like I I pray about it. I make sure that God is in it. I make sure that I use wisdom in my decisions, and so. I want people to understand that you can still be amazing in business. You can still have, you know, many streams of income coming in and still understand that it's only because God has allowed it to happen, right? And it's not on some prosperity yes. doctrine stuff. Yeah. It's just more so on some saying, like, listen, like I can still be living a life that doesn't have to be rooted in lack, right? And mm-hmm. still love God and still be giving to other people and still be sowing into other people. So that's really the whole concept of the song. You know what I mean? Like I, I prayed for it and then I made a move. Like right I didn't pray for it and just sit on it. Like I prayed for it and then I made a move. Like God yeah. honored it and I made a move. So that's kind of the whole concept for that particular song. And just talks about, you know, the different opportunities and streams uh, of income that the Lord has been able to bless me with, you know? No. That's um again gems. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's we all need to hear that. It's very important. It's just because you are a believer doesn't need, mean that you need to be struggling. <laughs> That's true. Very true. Very true. Okay. What about level up? Oh man, level up. Uh, level up is all right. So I go back and forth between level up and you see it as my favorite record because. Like, Level Up is, is interesting. So my guy, Ron Riley, um, he's an amazing producer. And when he sent me the track for, Le- for Level Up, like, I just was like, man, this is just an amazing record. Like, he, he felt like it was where I was in life. He felt like he seen me, you know, grow. And he seen me go from where I was to where I am now. Um, in all the different areas of my life. And so he was like, dude, you just leveled up something crazy. So I had a difficult time writing to level up because of the way the beat is. Like, I, I'm, I'm more of a boom bap, like 90s type of hip hop. And, and, the, and the track, the way he produced it, it's, just, it's, it's, it's amazing. I love the yeah, record though. I, I see you what you're what saying mean? though. I get it. Because it was one of the tracks where I was like, okay, this is a, a switch up. It's yeah, it was definitely a change up. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but, but it's crazy because it's, a lot of people's favorite track, the way I, you know what I'm saying, maneuver the, maneuver the verse. So, um, all right, so level up. Uh, level up is how I maneuver they drought. I bottled they rivers of doubt. I took it in patches. They made it immaculate. Then I distributed out. See, off in the bottom, it's looking like Sodom a lot. I had to get out. The floor resurrection, and this is my section. I'm standing my feet on your couch. I planted my faith on the rock. Now look at the rock on my spouse. My son and my daughter have been walking on water. The blessing is all on my house. Need land and 40 acres. Told my lawyer draft all the papers. Projects for 100 neighbors. Everybody need 100 favors. Hands down for the hands out. Overseas be these whereabouts. Full click how I air it out. With the Holy Spirit, never fear in doubt. 
where I'm from, from they don't run, run. We like Rondo with the running gun, head honcho, get the on slow him talking over, he ain't running nothing, and then it's a hook. <laughs> So, um, that's I like the flow on that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the the cadence was different. Um, I mean I like the first two bars that are my favorite. You know how I maneuvered they drought, I bottled they rivers of doubt. I took it, them packaged it, made it immaculate, then I distributed it out. Like yeah. so, it's like you you took like what everybody said you couldn't do and how they doubted you, and it's almost like you took that river of doubt and you bottled it and you packaged it and then you distribute it, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody, and that's how you made it out. So, I mean, it, it really speaks to taking your circumstance and your situation and allowing it to, for one, make way for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's all this has done for me is me taking, my, me taking my circumstance and my situation and allowing God to make way for me. So that's, that's really level up, you know? Perfect, okay. And lastly, you see it. Yeah, so you see it, like I said, it's, it's back and forth between you see it and level up in my favorite song. Um, but I think you see it might be my favorite verse. Um, and I don't, I don't know if it's my favorite verse. It, it, I think it is my favorite verse. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a rap to knowledge. <laughs> All, right. All right, so it goes run for cover because undercover they frogs the way that they jump side the game is like leapfrog i got four dogs on call like old dog ready to go dog a minute with the spinach i am top high with the flow dog the whole game is high but i've been chilling low dog and og to your og see i am not your dog i hear a bunch of waves on repeat like it's sonar satan's on a leash he can only go but so far hold him back my lord Hold them back. They hope I keep it concealed. Like when I'm holding the strap, but the truth don't die and it can't be buried. I got God inside. Boy, that's word to pregnant Mary. The whole game is oh so strange, dog. You see it. The masses will believe anything, dog. You see it. They ain't got respect for the name, dog. You see it. In the end, only one gon' rain, dog. You see it. You see it. That's you see it. Yeah, I think so, that might be my favorite. Okay, I was going to ask. So, <laughs> <what> is it? <laughs> then why is it um, your favorite? I just think, I, I I just think it because the honesty in it. So, like, I think a lot of times we we have this feeling like the enemy, the devil, is just so you know big and bad, but he's not. Like, he's on a leash. He can only do so much. He can only do what God allows him to do, you know what I'm saying? And we and we see that in his dealing with Job. So it, it gives me confidence to know that, all right, like the devil is doing what he's supposed to be doing, but he's on a leash. Like he's a dog on a leash that can only go so far. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and really, I like the part, you know what I'm saying? Like um, the truth don't die and it can't be buried. I got God inside, boy, that's word to pregnant Mary. You know what I'm saying? Like just having the Holy Spirit, having Christ on yeah. the inside of us um, in parallel, parallel or not to, <laughs> to Jesus inside of Mary. Um, but I think that's something that we have to always keep in mind, man. When you walk with God and you have the Holy Spirit inside you, like there is, there is nothing that's impossible for you um, that's in the will of God for you. There's nothing that's impossible. And I, and I think I try to keep that, that mindset in mind at all times. Preach. That's perfect. Um, all right. Well, is there anything else that you think we should know? You have any projects or anything you want to promote? Well, uh, in summer's ear, it's going to drop this summer. So um, my, my plan is to do spring, summer, fall, and winter. Okay. So that is my, that's my plan. So y'all hold me to it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please subscribe to our show. And if you really enjoy the content, please leave a review. It really does help with the ranking. For all things testimony, visit TestimonyStories.com. Until next time, I'm Gilika Brown, the music lover constantly seeking positive music.